Hey, it's Lee. Welcome to Business Problem Solved. Today, I have the immense pleasure of, uh, of talking to a guest who, um, this is the first conversation I've had with them, but I've heard their name mentioned many, many times over the last few years. Um, so I'm really fortunate to do what I do and to, to learn from amazing people and work with amazing people. And, and over the last four years, there's one name that has been mentioned um, probably more than any other name and that is the name of the guest that i am speaking to today so mr carl clem welcome to business problem solved hi lee yeah. how, how are you well you know i'm old and fat and bold and tired but that's the way i always am <laughs> that's exactly how i describe myself as well <laughs> <laughs> so, so yep, for those, fine. yeah perfect perfect so for those people who don't know who carl clem is who is Carl Clem and how has he got to sit in that seat today? Uh, well, um, I, uh, I'm a Yorkshireman and uh, I started off as an apprentice with uh, uh, Vauxhall Motors, actually, back when I was that, and uh, worked for 23 and a half years with them, ended up as a general manager um, uh, in charge of total quality for the plant plus a paint shop uh, for manufacturing cars uh, in uh, Luton and then, well, first Dunstable, then Luton, then Ellesmere Port. Uh, and then uh, when Toyota moved into the UK, uh, I was asked to, to come and interview and I started with them as General Manager for Quality Assurance. Amazing. And uh, I was with Toyota for 25 years. Uh, and at that, that time, Toyota was only the UK plant in, in Europe. So we were involved in everything, suppliers and reliability, and it was great. And, um, and then uh, the headquarters moved to Brussels. Uh, during the 25 years, I was in, responsible for quality, and then I moved to responsibility for manufacturing. Uh, and then I moved to take over the responsibility for the engine plant in Deeside in North Wales. And uh, after that, uh, I became president of Toyota Motor Manufacturing Poland. Wow. And I was there for six years. And after that, I retired uh, because of reasons I won't go into relating to inline revenue. And uh, uh, then I worked for another six months for Toyota Europe, finishing what I'd been doing on a pan-European basis. Uh, and then I started a consultancy. Because when, when I first started uh, with Toyota, I was sitting with the... the the interview board, which was the president and, uh, you know, the plant and uh, several people. And the president asked, only had one question. He said, why do you want to join Toyota? And I said, I spent four years studying Toyota for GM, including the plant in Fremont in uh, California, Numi. Yeah. And I said, uh, then I came back and tried to implement it and I failed with the, t the rest of the team of eight of us that were with me, failed miserably. But I want to succeed, so I want to join, I want to learn how it's done, and then I want to share it with as many European companies and organisations as I possibly can. And he laughed. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> he said, that's a good reason. So, <laughs> yeah. and they gave me the job. So, uh, yeah. Amazing. And, and that is... That is an amazing answer to that question, and, and I guess an honest answer um, to that question, because because what you have done since, and, and, and what I should have said during the, the introduction, is you've recently written a book um, yes. that, has, that has just been launched. So I guess this is this this is you again finding other, another medium to to share what you learned, um, and and and. The consultancy part, I, in fact, I've got so, so many questions. And I think that my very first question comes from, from your book, which is the, uh, the, the balance of, of excellence. And it says here um, that the transition, so it's right, right at the beginning. And it says that your transition, the transition that you've just spoken about um, was not an easy one. Um, when you've gone from a typical Western command and control manager to, to Toyota, when you said it wasn't an easy one, what, was the, what were the biggest differences and and, and challenges that you faced? Um, with, with, with GM uh, uh, at that time, and I'm sure it's changed now, but that's 20, 25 years ago, 20, 30 years ago now. Um, at that time with GM, it was very much uh, managed top down. 
It was truly command and control. Um, it was an environment in which you survived on your own. Um, and it was fiercely competitive. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and I could survive in that environment, and I did, succeeded. But then in terms of when I went to Toyota, it was so much more emphasis on collaborating better, planning better, working with people better. And it was a major change. I think I also say in the book, I, I, I used to joke that all I had to do was take my head off and put it on the other way around, and it was easy. But yeah. you know, that, it was literally that. I had, to, I had to unlearn so much. Yeah. And my teachers at the time, my Japanese teachers, were busy trying to teach me and at the same time, you know, let's get the plant started and everything else. And I was pulling on my oar and half the time they were saying, get your hands off because you're growing the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, really tough. Going, coming from being a, a very successful general manager in, in GM to um, a general manager in Toyota, but realizing very quickly that I was an apprentice was yeah. really hard to swallow. Really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. And it took it took me it took me about five years to finally adjust and understand what it was all about, and to do things where people said, "Yeah, yeah, 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 go ahead." When it when it was as difficult as it was in those early days for you with the transition, did you have any regrets in joining? N oh, never. No, no never. Um, I loved every minute of it. To be honest, in terms of what I was learning and what was happening. Um, most of the time I was in awe, uh, but the, the, no, I can't, I can't think of anything that I regretted, to be honest with you, nothing. Yeah, amazing. I mean, when you spoke about um, your, your transition and your answer that you gave, um, and, and you said that you'd been learning about Toyota um, for, the, for the four years and you failed in, in delivery um, of, of what you'd learned, is there, or if you had succeeded in in creating a GM Toyota, would you would you have left and joined Toyota, or would you have thought there was no real need to? At the very best, from the studies that we've done, we would have made just the beginning of the beginning of a Toyota. Yeah. And I was desperate to learn more because I could just see walking around the Numi plant in, in Fremont and, um, uh, and seeing what they were doing and how they were doing it. Uh, I, I thought, no, this is, there's so much depth to this. It's, you, you could put a team of psychoanalysts, psychologists, human resource professionals in there for a decade and they wouldn't get to the bottom of it. Yeah, really. It's it's that it's that deeply uh, established um, Im deeply embedded in in working with people and growing people and and getting the business benefits from that. Make no mistake, it's about good business. It's about business. Yeah, it's the way it's done. Yeah. Got you. I, I love I, lo I love the word depth. Then when you when you're describing and um, because because I guess when when people have tried to copy, um, they've scratched the surface of a tool, and and they've I guess they've thrown tools to try to to try to replicate what what had been uh, or has been achieved at Toyota. And and when you talk about that depth, what is it that that has is it is it just the length of time that they've been doing it? So it, the, the habits and behaviours have been have been formed and are just ingrained. Um, is what what is it that has given the depth to Toyota and and why why some companies don't try to go as deep? Don't don't try to make it as deep. I mean, it's a really bad question that I've asked, but but yeah, what what prevents us from going deeper? 
Um, or what do you think prevents people from going deeper? In your experience within Toyota and then and then the consultancy that's followed, um, that prevents the success of organisations? I think you mentioned tools in the beginning. And I think if, if you read the book and whatever, um, you have to use tools. They don't yeah. necessarily have to be the same, but they have to do the same job. Yeah. And... Uh, so from that point of view, yes, there are tools. Uh, we recommend some. But if you've already got something that you can use instead and it does just as good a job, fine. Um, why change? Um, but in terms of not being able to get to the depth, you hit the nail on the head when, in your question, Lee. It, it, it's, um, Toyota has spent 75, now 80 nearly years um, learning yeah and and um they they, they describe it as like a, a t system everybody's joined at the top of the t and you have to understand the picture as much as you can the whole picture but as your role and in your responsibility you have to go deep gotcha much, much, much deeper than most organizations dream about, to be honest with you. I was yeah. amazed when I asked Toyota experts questions about something and they started to explain it. I, OK, you know, this is your life's vocation. You really know this stuff, you know, yeah. uh, to the nth degree. So it's why don't why don't other organizations do? I think they do. They try to. If, if those that are succeeding, they try to. Uh, and they will succeed if they continue to try, but it's it's just PDCA, it's trial and error. Yeah. Uh, and learning. And Toyota's yeah. been learning for, say, nearly 80 years, and he's still learning, even now. Yeah, I love that. I love that, the, the continual learning. When you became a consultant, when you when, when you left Toyota, um, and because I, I guess people will, will see you, and rightly so, as... As, as somebody who has knowledge of um, of Toyota and being able to understand the the what's made it successful and then maybe work with organisations to help them get better, do people acknowledge that it is going to take time, or do they see you as somebody the silver bullet um, and it, it, to be able to help them expedite that that progress? I think that's a really important question because some people see this side of the, the TPS or the Toyota way as being, as you say, a set of tools uh, which you just learn and do. Um, but once you start doing them properly, it pulls you in um, because it makes you ask the next question and the next question and the next question yeah. it kind of leads you in. And a lot of organizations feel that I'm doing TPS because I want to do TPS. I'm doing it because it's going to give me some value for the organization in terms of money or capacity or whatever they need right now. And the point I try to make to everybody is, to be honest with you, it doesn't matter where you start. If you want to start with a silver bullet because you have this particular problem and you want it solved, it's how you go about solving it that matters. Yeah. And in fact, you should be doing the most important things for your business in terms of giving the best bang for the buck, the best value, the best customer return, that's where you should be spending your money. There should never be a conflict between that and doing these things. These things should be how you do it. Yes. If you see what I mean. Yes. And, and so it's, it's, there is never a question. Business is business. Yeah. Whatever you do should give business benefit. And ideally, it should be the business benefit that you most need right now. Yeah. So if you're doing that, and you do it this way, Yes. there's never a conflict, it's never a question. 
it's just yeah this is how we're doing it and look we got a result yes yeah so i don't like that it's a really important question and i think it's one of the things that people stumble with and one of the one of the things that people struggle with is i'm so busy now trying to do this and now you're asking me to do that as well yeah i can't yeah how, 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 how do you get them to see the way and get them to overcome that feeling that you're asking them to do more than than or they they perceive that you're you're giving them more work to do uh, potentially uh, because you you're trying to solve this but you're trying to do it this way which is different to how, so they're learning two different things they're learning a, a new way and we'll talk about the way in, in, in a minute but how, how do you get them to to see the value of of doing it the way and not just solving the problem there is only one way and that is that you do it together in the beginning they don't know how to do this way yeah but they want to do something they've got a problem to solve the role of, of, of the coach in this case is to say, okay, let's do it together. And this time I'll lead. Yeah. But next time you lead. And then I'll, I'll, I'll come behind you and just confirm and, and give you a little nudge where you need a nudge, you know? Yeah. But, but um, there is no other way actually than doing it. Yes. And, and that's why at the beginning of the, my first sentence is I've, swore never to write this book yeah I swore and and for six years i didn't <laughs> but uh, finally i realized that i had to just to support people who are trying to help other organizations and and, and for organization heads who are trying to change somebody had to show kind of the bigger picture what what makes you believe that 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 you've no not what makes you believe that i guess that in you you six years you didn't want to write the book and then, then you have to, to help other people and there's things that are in your book that are not really spoken about in a lot of the other books that are, that are out there um what's the re what's the reason for that what's the reason that 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 you've um, decided to share these things, but put them in a different light than is already out there. On the, because there, there is difference in, in your language when when you uh, we, and we spoke before um, before we hit record about um, process memory, and and those are the, those are two words that I have um, fallen in love with in, in read it, reading your book, and, and they will be for they will form part of my language because I think those that's that's really valuable. A, a different way to look at something that is resisted currently. Um, so I guess, I, I, I guess, what is it that's gave, given you the confidence to to write this book, and you think that, you, and you know that you're going to be solving a problem that exists? Because there's so much, so much that's written already, isn't there? Yes, lots and lots, and I didn't want to duplicate that. Yeah, uh, because there's so much. But I think a lot of writers, uh, when they, they start, if you're not basing it on theory, if you're basing it on practice and actual, then what prompted me was the organizations that I was working with were using help and it was good help, but they weren't getting the maximum benefit from what they were doing and if they just did it slightly differently or with a slightly different emphasis or something, they could get massive benefits from that effort. So I'd see one organization that was really wonderful at uh, visualized boards and daily meetings, et cetera, et cetera. And they'd be doing that for 10 years. And then they ask themselves the question, oh, what am I getting for this in terms of my business's bottom line? And when you look at it, you, the answer is really clear. Ah, because everybody's doing wonderful things. They're doing good things. But those good things are not connected to the business result or the business's priorities. 
So it's very important that that connection is, you know, titanium steel yes. connection. Yeah. And that must be the driver. So that, that sort of thing wasn't just in one organization, that kind of example over various different things I saw in many organizations that I worked with. And I thought, they're really working hard, they're doing great things. The people that are helping them are doing great things, but there's just that missing connection. And the book is designed to make some of those missing connections. Yes. It's that hopefully to give some people a little, aha, I've done a lot of good work. I don't have to throw it away. I just modify a little bit and bang, I'm going to get the bang for the buck. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's, it's really key because I think in, in the change community, um, there's a, everybody talks about like that improvement needs to be done bottom up. Um, and and some things like solution development that people know more about and all of that stuff that is bottom up but the expectation and alignment and, and I guess needs to come from role and role modeling needs to come top down and I, I guess what's what's your take on on where improvement needs to be done for in, in, in your book actually I think you say it's a, that uh, your pilot team has to be the top should be the top table um first and foremost but that's not often where people start is it no and and that's one of the biggest issues that everybody struggles with if there's a disconnection between the expectations and the methods and the requests for reporting style etc between the top people and the people doing the work for the people doing the work i have never found anybody anywhere that doesn't want to do it the way that, that works with the visualization, et cetera, et cetera. They love it. They feel the benefit as soon as they're doing it. But if the top doesn't change, then they have really have to work twice because they have to do the things that they want to do. And then they have to translate it and also be diverted by what's coming from here. And it, it's, it's unsustainable for anybody. So in finally, one thing has to give and it ain't going to be the boss. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one of the things, it's a real issue for many, many, many organizations. And that's why I say, if you're the top and you don't want to change, that's fair. You got where you are because you're really good at what you do. If you weren't really good at what you do, you wouldn't be where you are. Yeah. So not saying that what you're doing is wrong, but you could get even more by doing it another way. Yes. And if you're open to that, let's go if you're not open to that then fine yeah yeah and you'll no. succeed you know you, you you're already successful yes so yes i'm, I'm working with a um a, a national organization at the minute and um i had no influence over where where they started and the, and the pilot location and, and what's we're at a point now where they have we have we, we've we've created a, a rhythm and a a communication flow within within a single location and what it is highlighted and i see this in a, in a number of organizations is that before be, be, before i work with them they'll have like a monthly meeting structure um and all, and all of that stuff but then when you've introduced a daily meeting or a few times a day meeting and this is the cycle that's in here and it's feeding into a monthly meeting structure there's a huge disconnect there and it, it exposes the problem far far bigger because the feedback loops before might have been between a week and a month but now they're, they're like many times a day feeding into a monthly structure and and so something has to give and and i and do you do you see that or, or do you just work do you work in your book as well so you work with the, the top tables and, and, and stuff um and and do you see and how do you overcome or do you um this disconnect if if you were working with an organization that was was here would you would you stop working with them or would you try to prove the gap and how would you how would you tackle mm. first of all just to correct something I, I work at every level yes yeah i'm just as happy working with a team figuring out 
you know, a shop, a shop floor problem or an office problem as I am working with a top team. I really am. Yeah. I love it. So it, it all motivates. Um, one of the things that I really recommend is that uh, and, and push for and work with is how to make that connection. Um, because if it's not there, you know, you're not going to succeed. And in some organizations, you walk away. You do. Yeah. Because it's not just not going to happen. And in other organizations, they jump on it. Yeah. And okay, okay, let's try, let's try. And the, there's a lot of prejudices to overcome. And I'm going to say prejudice, I don't mean a negative way prejudice, I mean learned truths, <laughs> normals yeah. that have to be overcome. And sometimes it's just by going and seeing. It, it's really effective. Yeah. The, the Toyota doesn't say go and see for no reason. You just say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but just come with me, please. Let's stand here together and look and what do you see and what do I see? Yeah. And and it's usually quite, quite <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then we talk about it, and then things begin to be real. And so progress is made. And yes, we've had some successes, and we've had some where I just have to say, well, frankly, uh, you can't push a water up hill with a stick. Really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, completely. Completely. You, you talk very passionately, Carl. You, you you smile and you laugh when you and you light up when you're talking about about the way and and and, and your your lessons and things. Is what is it that you love about? I'm going to use just the word improvement. But what is it that you love about about what it is that you do? Because uh, it's about people. Uh, it's all about people. And, uh, and there's nothing better to work alongside and with than people. Uh, and uh, there's, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing people, seeing that light go on. Ah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, I do get emotional about it. And sometimes I get really emotional about it. Um, uh, when somebody turns around and, and uh, there, there was one guy that uh, he was a team leader in, in a plant and he turned around and said, I, I think I've been there about five years and he said, will you come and look at what I've done? And I said, yes, okay. And uh, he had been talking to a, a tool supplier who'd said to him, this, this tool we're, we're supplying you with doesn't need coolant to cut metal and uh, so he, he said but we're using coolant so then he went back through the engineers and everywhere and he said why are we using coolant and they said well to cool the work and he said well you don't need to so they said but if you don't do that then the the swarf the bits that come off the cut metal won't go down into the bottom out of the way and we'll end up with a clogged machine and he said, okay. And he spent, I don't know how many weeks, designing bits of sheet metal to fit inside the machine so that the bits of metal would just automatically fall down and not get stuck anywhere. Yeah. And he'd done that with six machines and he'd saved, I don't know how much environmental impact, how much money in coolant, because coolant is really expensive. It's high tech stuff. People don't understand. So it... And, and that went through the whole of the organization worldwide, you know, and, uh, and, and this was just a team leader who was in production. He wasn't a maintenance guy. He wasn't an engineer. He, he just was a guy who felt that he could try things and do something. And when he presented it to me, I said, well, I, I don't even know where, where to begin to talk to you. Yeah. You know, full. I was full. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. I love that. Have people always been um, the most important thing in your eyes? Or is it something that you've learned over time? Uh, when I was a young guy, uh, especially when I was 
when I was first foreman, as it was then in those days, the foreman of the, of the group, when I was coming up and I was a foreman, uh, no, I wasn't like that. I was going to be boss. And boss yeah. was what I was. And um, uh, I feel really sorry for anybody who worked with me at that time. It must have been horrible. Um, no, I, it wasn't natural. It wasn't. Um, but it came with more and more working with people. And then when I came to Toyota, it really clicked. Yeah, this is why Toyota's strong. Yeah. 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 Is, there, is, there any, is there any particular lesson that, that hit that home um, for you? Or was it just the, 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 the gradual, the, the coaching, the support, and you seeing it in action? Um, I'm trying to think back now. I was due to go down to the shop floor with it. I think it was about three months in. I was due to go down to the shop floor to see some people who'd done a, like a, a QZ circle activity. And uh, just as I was about to go down, we had a big issue, a big problem. Uh, and I just said, okay, I'll go and deal with that problem. Tell the people I'm not coming. And my, my um, partner, Japanese partner at the time said to me, those people are prepared. This is very important for them. It, for them to present to you as the general manager is an enormous, first of all, worrying thing, but they've been supported in preparation, so they're not worried anymore. But also, it's such a, an awe-inspiring thing. And you're just going to say no when they're standing there waiting for you? He said... Give somebody else this problem to deal with. They can take care of that and you can follow after you've seen this. But don't ever do that to people. Wow. And that was a really good lesson for me. Yeah. That was like, no, the, the important thing is the people. Yes. The problem will be a problem or fixed or whatever, but this is, this is people. And it yeah. really resonated. It really deeply resonated. And uh, I thought, no, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, completely. If we just talk about your book briefly, the, the balance of excellence. Where did the name come from? Um, and what does it mean to you? Oh. Excuse me. I'll start the book with a diagram with two wheels. Uh, one wheel is the business imperative, making, making money, expanding having enough capacity all the business imperatives yeah uh if you like the business improvement or performance wheel but what toyota taught me was right from the beginning was that there is another wheel which actually is connected to the first one and should be connected with a rigid axle which is that people should be developing whilst they're working, whilst they're doing what they do. They should always be growing, developing, becoming more confident, becoming more competent, becoming more challenging, be able to tackle bigger issues. This should happen at the same time. If it's not happening at the same time, you're out of balance. Yeah. And every time one wheel is going faster than the other, you go off course from the potential best benefit. And so therefore this balance is truly important and if you keep that balance always thinking when you're thinking about what the business needs and how can that be used or how can that develop the people best but not only in the routine ways but with who's assigned to what activity etc etc then the balance is in place and if the balance is in place you're going to have excellence yeah so it's the balance of excellence yeah what at what point did you um, did you name the book before writing the book or did you write the book and then name the book? Uh, I named it first, to be honest. Did you? Did yeah. You? Yeah, yeah. I, I like that. Because, because, you're, because of the concept of the two wheels, it, 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 it makes perfect sense. And when, when we talk about the where, and when you said you, before you spoke about solving a problem, but doing it the where, um, if you had to summarise the where... Um, cool. Uh, we, uh, That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's, it's summarised in the book. It, it's uh, um, 200 and odd pages. But um, if you had to summarise the way, how would you? 
firstly, as I've said, I don't know how many times now, I'm probably boringly, the business priority is always the business priority. That never changes. What the business needs is priority. Not that it needs priority, it is the priority. Yeah. And there's many ways that can be done. But if the business is always, always doing things in a way that develops people, grows people, whichever tools you want to use and whatever system you want, providing that people are being coached and challenged and supported, then that's what I mean by the way. Yeah. And uh, so there's some tools involved which make it, the, the tools are designed to introduce it by doing and then when you're doing it, you start to see some gaps and then you start trying to close the gaps and then you see new ones and new ones and new ones and that it leads you into it. And um, some people ask me a question, but where should you start? Should you start with quality? Should you start with safety? Should you start with something? And I always answered, just imagine a crystal that's got facets on it. It's a round, round sort of shape, mm -hmm. but it's got facets on it, okay? And one facet's got cost on it, and one facet's got safety, and one facet's got delivery on time, and one facet's got maintenance, and one facet's got, you know, supplier part. And one, and so there's this crystal with all these labels on the facets. It doesn't matter which one you go in on. Once you're in, you're going to deal with all of them. Yeah. I, I, I had one, of, one of the guys said, well, why when you go into a company, do you ask them what's their priority? What's their imperative? What are they trying to do? Because they may not be trying to do where you start. And I always say, think about the crystal. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Everything is connected to everything else. Yes. Yes. And when you talk about business priorities in the book, you just about thought of that one of, one of your quotes in the book is something like um, that you should put your body where the priorities are. Yes. Um, yes. And, and what I often see is people putting the words where the priorities are, not necessarily the bodies. How do you encourage them to, to I mean, it comes back to going and seeing, like you, like you mentioned earlier on. Um, and to get them to do it the first time, because the benefits can be seen the first time they do it in, in most cases. Mm. How do you get them to put the body where the priorities and not just the words? I think that literally, um, I use the rule of 12 in the beginning because this is not intuitive. Top management is busy. They don't have any spare time. Yeah. They are trained. We are trained, if you like, because I was top management. We're trained that we have to look at something that somebody's been working on for 18 months or 12 months and six months, and we get it to in front of us for 10 minutes and we have to make a decision. Okay. And so we are trained like that. <laughs> yeah. And we're busy. So you're asking me now to get up and walk that half a mile and look at that thing? I haven't got time. And so I use the rule of 12, which says, listen, 12 times you have to do this with me. You have to commit to that. So when we start talking about something, like here's a problem over there, I say, stop, come here, let's go. Let's stand there and look at it together. And then let's see how long it takes to figure out what should be done. And how yeah. accurate that is and how quickly it gets resolved compared with meeting in a meeting room with 20 people who have never even looked at it. Yeah. So you've got 20 opinions fighting each other for status. Yeah. Whereas when you're standing there looking at it, and if they say, oh, I need so-and-so, bring them. Let's look, bring them. And we're all looking at it together. The BS disappears immediately. Egos disappear immediately because you're just talking about fact. Yeah. And so the rule of 12 is what I use. I, I, I say, look, you, you, sorry about this, but if you want to do it, we have to do the rule of 12. Bef way before 12 times. 
they don't need to be told anymore. Yeah. They own it from then on. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Where else do you use the rule of 12? Where need be. Usually, usually also for the daily meetings. Yeah. The, the top management don't have an image of we should meet daily. Yeah. We're a bit busy to meet daily. And so I say, no, come on, come on. This is another rule of 12 thing. I can't, I can't show you it without you doing it. Yes. So wherever that applies, wherever I can't explain it to you properly, we just have to do it together. Yeah. So let, let's do the rule of 12 on this. Yeah, I love that. And if at the end of 12 times you really don't like it, <laughs> you're not going to own it ever. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah no i love that love that really good really good um what's your hope for the book carl i've written it uh from a selfish point of view to help me to explain to people especially top management people what it is we're talking about and how it all fits together and which bit of it we're working on now so there is some structure for which they can, you know, they've got the coat hangers, they can put the coats on yeah. in, in some sort of structured way. And uh, so that's one of my hopes, is that not only will it help me to explain to different people, but also there's a lot of people inside organisations that are already top management or are supporting top management or are brought in externally to try and support. Yeah. And I've written it to say, look, if you like, here is something that might help you to say, look, this is the big picture. It'll take you four or five hours to read if you can do that, if you've got a couple of plane journeys or something. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, or you're in a hotel and have dinner with a sod or else to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that will tell you the whole picture. And then what we're doing fits here. Yeah. And it allows people to plug in and give the organisation that they're working inside or externally for and the top people themselves the idea that this is a structured thing. It is a whole. And this is this part of it. And so therefore, and I need that now, so let's do that now. So it, it, it puts things in context for everybody. And it takes away that... that um, well, you taught me that, but that's not everything, is it? <laughs> no, it isn't. It never was. It never will be. Yeah. And also, the other thing is, my hope for the book is that for people who are helping other organisations or people who are working inside organisations or for the top management, that they will realise that some of these seemingly strange, little, unimportant things are actually the priorities. Yes. Not yeah. this, it, it's actually, it's, it, you know it's there, but you never look at it. <laughs> but actually, that's where you should be working. Yes. So I'm hoping it does that. And that's my hope for the book. It's a tool. I've tried to make a tool to help people do those things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I, and, um, and like I said, just before I hit record, I'm three quarters of the way through it. And, and I think you've def definitely achieved that. What, what, have you, what have you learned in writing the book? Oh, wow. What a question. Yeah. Uh, a lot. Um, I've learned that it's really hard to explain things piece by piece. And yet keep the total structure in mind. Yeah. And there's always a risk that you'll disappear off down the rabbit hole. <laughs> rather than keep the focus on where on, on, on the bigger picture. Um, I learned that even from the first feedback, I've learned that everything that can be misinterpreted will be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is lovely because it starts conversations. Yes. Um, and um, and it's really reinforced my feeling that there's nobody out there that is deliberately not doing the best they can. 
because every example that I came to, to, to put in, it reminded me that those people were already pulling the tripes out, trying to do what they were supposed to be doing. You know, yeah. none of them were just like cruising. Yeah. Um, and if and and so that really reinforced it for me again that that um, it became very solid in my mind that everything that we do we have to bear in mind that the people that we're working with are already doing what they think is right earnestly yeah and so never lose sight of that yeah i love that i love that i i often say that nobody goes to work to do a bad job it's mm. just that we don't necessarily help people do a um, the best job that they can um, yeah and, and people make decisions based on the information that, 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 that they've got at that point in time. If it, when you, and when you look back three months, six months, six years, then you're not looking at it with the same eyes that they made that, that decision. I think it's re really important. Yeah, I love that. I love I, that. I, I, a similar analogy, it's a very similar analogy. You go for a walk in the countryside. Yeah. And uh, this is why I didn't want to write the book because you go for a walk in the countryside and you start walking and you have a good look around and then you walk 10 paces and look around again, it's different. Yeah. And then you turn around face the other way, we're coming back and it's different again. And that's what learning's like. And that's yes. what improvement's like. You stop every 10 paces and have a look around. And that's, that's, that's the analogy that I use that's similar to yours, which yeah. is, oh, is it's it's the scenery changes every 10 steps you know never mind every six years or something so yeah uh and then people see the next gap the next gap the next gap and and providing you stop them chasing rabbits <laughs> and they start following the real path yeah and then it's a great great experience yes uh, have you always been a, a, an avid and keen learner or is, is it something that you've learned have you learned to learn or have you always been a learner? Uh, I, for generations, I think my family has a wonderful history of being what is known as late starters. Okay. <laughs> really, 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 really late starters. I think um, we, we all did okay, but in terms of really having the enthusiasm to learn, it came to came to generations in my family, midlife rather than early life. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't I can't say you know this has been my nature. No. <laughs> yeah. Do you, Do you see yourself as successful, Carl? Um. When I when I was when I was doing my apprenticeship, I had a dream that one day, mind you, bear in mind this was nineteen sixty seven. I had a dream that one day I'd be an engineer and I'd earn two thousand pounds a year, and that was my ambition. Well, wow. to be an engineer yeah. and good enough to earn two thousand pounds a year, and everything that's happened since then has been kind of a plus. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think from that point of view, yeah, I've done all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, com yeah, completely, completely. No, that's amazing. Amazing, amazing. I could talk. I could talk to you um, all day, all day. And um, I, I guess actually, when when I said about the, the words process memory and the language, so be before we spoke um, or before we hit record, um, we spoke about it and we touched on it in this conversation. But what's your what's your definition of of process memory? Because this this is like I said, it, it's one of my favourite things mm, in the book. Mm. So how would how would you define process memory? Um, yeah, what does it mean to you? Yeah, it carefully chosen words, Lee, to be honest with you, because because uh, when I started at Toyota, the very thought of standardization was animetic, yeah. honestly. And uh, and so it was to everybody that I've met. It's it's a what do you mean we have to we have to document it and and, and Actually, you don't have to document it. If you're happy that you're just going to have experts who can do things and other people who can't. And also if you're happy 
that somebody made a Kaizen, but then nobody else uses it. You don't need it. Yeah. So if you want people to remember things, you don't need process memory. But if you want the process to remember it so that whoever does it gets the benefit of everything that people have learned before, yeah. again and again, on and on, so the process itself becomes better and better and better, you need process memory, which is, is, is very important in terms of getting the benefit of the activity to everybody rather than just to some individuals yeah and very important in making sure we don't lose stuff along the way and when people work hard and solve problems and they've solved a problem and they found the solution and they've incorporated it in what they do the most disillusioning thing is oh and then nobody else will do it from now on there's somebody else will come in and all that will be lost but no if we put it in the process memory yeah days yeah so all that work that i've done adds value even after i'm gone yeah and yeah so the process memory means that it means the process learns yeah. and whoever does that process from then on has the benefit of all that learning already yeah it's re it's re it's really really powerful those two words together and and it takes the, I guess standardization to a, to a new level it gives it a, a different meaning I, th I think in, in terms of uh, how people are taught and, and how it's shared currently so no, so thank thank you for that and, and and thank you for the conversation today I guess just a couple more yeah a couple more questions what does a former um well what does a Toyota legend um have for the tea um, as often as possible, possible curry. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're fan, you're fan I, of a curry. I love, I love curry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's spicy food in general, but I love curry. Yeah, the hotter uh, the better, but, or or not? Do you, do you have a... oh, oh no, I'm not a fanatic. I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't. Eleven pints and a nice fall isn't my get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a, a curry, but what what are you having this evening? Do you know what, what's on the menu for this evening? Yes. Oh, what is it? Curry. Oh, it's curry. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Do, do you have a do you have a go to curry? Um, Jal or um, actually, I I really like um, Buna also. So those are the two that. But I don't I don't have a go to. I like going through the menu and trying everything. Yeah, no, perfect. And, and I guess that allows you then to have curry most nights because it's variety, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, no, amazing. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And and if people, which I'm sure they will, uh, want to know more about um, Carl Clem, uh, where would they go? What would they do? What would they find? Um, probably at the moment, uh, LinkedIn's the best bet uh, because that's where my I put you know my my CV and my um, uh, uh, my. Um, company uh car claim management solutions is is there um so that's a good place to go in in a, in a couple of weeks uh, there'll be a new website uh which is uh carclaim.com perfect and uh, and that'll that'll be available and and also probably uh you can find me on instagram if you look for me um so uh, that's what that's where you go and uh yeah amazing amazing thank you so when when you say it so um your your business is it just is it just you um I'd, i'm really happy to work with many other people but uh i really think it's important that the people that are working are working for themselves yeah uh, because they're growing then yeah and uh so i don't i don't encourage um legal partnerships in fact to be honest with you i think in the six years since i started doing consultancy i've had one legal contract wow and everything else has just been on word of mouth amazing and the only people that let me down were the people that i had the contract with oh wow <laughs> Wow. 
Wow, no, amazing, amazing. No, I love that. Honest, honestly, Carl, I just want to say thank you so much for the the conversation that we that we've had today. The opportunity to, to chat through with you, the opportunity to understand more of your, of your thinking on some of the concepts. Thank you so much for writing the book um, as well, and and that will be finished before the weekend. Um, and and good luck with with absolutely everything. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to uh, to catching up again soon. Nice to talk, Daily. Thanks very much. Cheers, Carl.